Hello, everyone. So we are here with Ryan Schock. We're happy to have you, and we're happy to talk to you. So tell us, what, what do you think? How, how are things with you? Things are great. Um, you know, COVID was tough uh, on my businesses and the band. But, uh, you know, when COVID hit, um, I think that my, it really shined a light on the, on the, you know, really serious addiction problem that I developed over, you know, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And especially with Chester passing, I think that in that last couple of years, I, I think I hit, I hit, I went straight down after that. So when COVID happened, I'm, I had two choices, you know, I was alone here at my house and, um, you know, no tours, no, no work, uh, you know, no money coming in. And I just decided, you know, uh, with a, the bottle of wine in my hand, um, you know, am I going to live or am I going to die? And I thought about, you know, I did think about it, actually Chester. Um, I know that some of the questions that you guys have have were regarding Dead by Sunrise and Chester and everything. So I, I know one of the reasons I'm here. And I just thought that he would want me to live and he would want me to try to try to see what it would be like to be free of the addiction and because i know that he we struggled with it together and so for the first time i i decided you know the world's shutting down so i'm going to go ahead and lock myself in a medical prison and uh, get some help and i did it um and i did about uh, 80 80 plus days of you know rehab and therapy and then i've got about 445 days uh, sober now and a large part of you know getting help was um in in therapy i had to have a grief a grief counselor a grief therapist to the, the, the biggest issues with me was losing chester and uh and it, and it almost killed me you know but uh I, you know he helped me understand uh, marco the the therapist uh, helped me understand that you know that you know that, that chester loved me and didn't want this to happen didn't want me to go, you know, it, none of this to happen, that it's, it's, uh, you know, what happened is a, is a horrible, horrible, you know, effective mental illness and addiction. And it's terrible, but that doesn't mean we have to keep, we doesn't mean we have to keep destroying everything. And um, we can, we can all know that, you know, everyone has their different spiritual beliefs, but I, I believe Chester's in a great place. And I believe he's, he, he wants us all to be healthy and happy and keep living. And so that took me a lot of therapy and everything. And I'd say that now, I mean, if you make a long story and epic, um, you know, you ask me how I'm doing and that's how I'm doing. I mean, I'm sober and I'm, I'm doing a lot of music and, um, a lot of good things are happening with both Edema and Julian K. Uh, Julian K just had a hit single and video edema is about to drop their first single and we have a, an amazing video and i think it's gonna i think it's gonna blow lincoln park fans away it's gonna blow edema fans away and i just think that i'm starting to do the best music i've ever done and um i don't know i'm in a i'm in a pretty good place despite all the problems i'm i'm okay so that's a good thing so thank you for asking <laughs> i love you <laughs> Just thanks for sharing like that's a lot like of course like we're doing an interview about music here, but these are serious stuff and it helps, you know, like people with similar problems that when you talk about it, when people that they look up to talk about it and then congrats, honestly. Thank you. Going through this and doing fine and being good right now. And we can't wait for the music to come, of course. But the Lincoln Park family is, has been, you know, an extended family to us and through Chester, through Mike and, our, our inclusion in that family and your guys' acceptance of us um, really to me means that I should be honest and inspiring and try to give as much love and support back as possible because you guys are, are such amazing human beings all over the world. So I'm very grateful. I really appreciate that. And I can think I can talk for all the fans. Thank you for sharing. Watch, yeah. You guys are there all the time for all the all the hard times. You guys are there and they had the good times. So, uh, you know, you got a lot of love coming from us and, and, and of course, Lincoln Park and everyone. So. Mm, so want to tell us how you first met Chester and the rest of the band, Lincoln Park? Yeah. Um, 
So Orgy was recording our second album, Vapor Transmission, uh, when Linkin Park was recording what became Hybrid Theory. At the time, Linkin Park was called Hybrid Theory, and uh, they didn't have the name Linkin Park. Maybe Linkin Park was a name that was floating around for the name of the album or something. I have no idea. Um, and at the time, in Orgy, I was the social butterfly. You know, um, I would you know bring beers or drinks over to whoever was next door to us. And you know, it was before all the addiction issues and everything became a huge, huge issue. It was back when all this was pretty fun and relatively harmless. And I was fluttering around, you know, we were in studio B, I think, and they were in studio A. It's, it's a building that's cut in half, right? I mean, it's connected and you can go through doors, but there's, they're the same size studios and there's A and B. And so labels rent out like an entire side for the band. There's break rooms and there's, you know, places to eat. And it's a really nice studio. And Lincoln Park's done a ton of work there. And so did we. So this was like a home to us. And I just noticed these kids next door. It was like fucking little kid. It was, I, I, to me, they look like little kids. Um, and I wasn't too old myself, but uh, um, I noticed one of them, a um, little scrawny guy, this little skinny guy that looked like he didn't weigh 90 pounds soaking wet. And his name was Chester. And he was kind of coming in and out with his little fucking wiry hair and shit. And I don't know why. I just thought he was kind of cool. He was kind of cute. I thought that he was just a you know, I, I, I just have, you know why, you know how you just kind of love Chester. You're just going to like him like so much when you see him. He always has that radiance, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I was attracted to him. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, in a friendly way, like I just kind of liked him, kind of thought it was nice, you know, had a, you know, cool person. So I kind of flutter around a little bit. And then I heard one day this screaming in the hallway, but it wasn't screaming. Like it was just, you know, ah, you know, the full, you know, just, and, and yelling and but it was really good and and i went in the hallway and i go who is that and in chester goes it's me you know and I, I go well, what the fuck are you doing he's like, oh i'm just warming up and like just i just yell sometimes to get warmed up and everything oh dude you're gonna blow your throat out doing that and i'm like that's insane you're just like i can hear you through the wall and we're in a recording studio and we were laughing and um we both went out front and just started talking and and we ended up talking for hours and I learned that he, it, it, we would keep meeting, we would keep leaving our bands and going out in front where of the door of the shared studios, you know, and we would just sit there and talk and sit on the steps, just like we were in high school or, or grade school together. And we found out that we liked a lot of the same things. We loved a lot of the same music. We come from the same vibe. We both come from extremely hot, dirty hometowns, you know, where it's, you know, it's a hundred and. 20 degrees in the summer. And it's, you know, when you live in heat like that, you know, it's, it, it affects your life. And we both wanted to get out of that and all that kind of stuff. So we were hitting on, on levels, you know what I mean? And, um, clicked right away. Uh, what's that? We clicked right away. We, oh, we clicked in, and before we even started talking, we were <laughs> waving at each other and we were being really friendly. You could tell that we had like a friendship kind of attraction there. And so we just, yeah, we just hit it off the first day. And then I started offering, you know, I found out that he was sleeping in his car. He was, you know, he was just doing what he had to do to get the music to happen and be there with Lincoln park. And he was from Arizona. And I, you know, when I started coming down to LA, you know, I would sleep in my car. I would do anything I could to get with the band and do what I had to do. So I was immediately going like this guy's, you know, I get him. And then I told him like, dude, you can come stay at my house. If you want to stay at my house, like you don't have to, you know, like I'm, you know, we sold millions of records last year. I've kind of got a lot of money right now. <laughs> like I totally help you out. And then, you know, and then I met his wife at the time, Samantha, and we all kind of became friends. And then they ended up, you know, getting a situation where they could stay somewhere. And so that all worked out. But, you know, long story short is, you know, within like one hangout session, you know, we had each other's phone numbers and we were calling each other outside of the band. And then one day we, the orgy guys, um, finally came over who's this band you got you're hanging out with ryan you know the usual thing and i'm like oh this band you know hybrid theory but i'm actually the singers become like a friend of mine i really really like him he's a really nice guy he's a really good singer too i'm like let's go listen to their music and so we went over and listened to their music <laughs> and we heard what became hybrid theory <laughs> and you know i heard it and i looked at chester and i go and he's like what do you think and and i go well i think that we're going to be opening for you soon and he started laughing and they were all being really cool and sweet. And I found out 
somewhere around that time, I found out that they were actually really, really big orgy fans and they had a lot of respect for orgy and they liked what we were doing. And they, they, I, I learned from Chester later on that, um, especially I found out kind of around then cause they were really stoked that we liked their stuff. And at that point we were the big band, you know, they were a new band yeah. and, um, and Chester told me later that, you know, a couple of our songs were thing were songs that, you know, Mike and Brad had kind of brought to the band and said, this is like, this is how good bands are now. We have to be this good or better. And that, you know, I don't know how accurate it is. That's just what Chester told me. And I thought that was really incredible, really sweet. And I was super honored, but I, I knew when I heard their music that this was significant for society and i knew that chester had a, had was going to be one of the greatest singers of, of the modern age and then um we stayed in touch after we got done with our albums or after orgy left and and you know we, we we ended up playing a major show up in san francisco that was amazing together and that was the first time we played together and then we did another um disturbed orgy lincoln park uh and some other big band um, we did a couple with orgy headlining and, and disturbed the Lincoln park open for us. <laughs> Freaking hilarious. And, um, and I kept and me and Chester really started hanging out then, you know, hanging out backstage, all that kind of stuff, drinking a lot, having a, being bad boys, having a lot of fun. And, um, and he was still super sweet, super awesome. And I still was just like, you know, he would come up and he's like, dude, they know the words to our songs. And I go, bro, I don't know if you would know what's going to happen soon, but this is going to change. You're going to, things are going to be different. <laughs> And then we finally played together in Phoenix, Arizona, his hometown. And he came up and was like, wow, you know, dude, we're like, we're like on the charts and all this kind of stuff. And they were getting close to where we were on the lineup. And we hung out that night and, and, and got super fucking wasted and, you know, crazy shit and had a great time. And by that time we were, I mean, we were, we were very close friends at that point. We were just like brothers and, I think maybe a month or two passed and then we were in another state back east and we were playing the radio show circuit and those are the big shows with all the big bands and it was lincoln park was on the bill and i'm super excited and i called chester hey we're gonna see you there you know find us when we get there let's find out you know let's hang out and when we got there um lincoln park was probably second third from the top and we were like just below them and i it, I, I think Chester he, he, like ran through all the backstage to find us and then ran into our room. It's like, Hey, I like that. And then I go, dude, I go, I told you. And he's all told you what, told me what? And I go, we're opening for you. <laughs> and he goes, Oh my God. And I go, I told you, dude, I told you, you guys are, you're destined for something incredible and you guys are just killing it. And I see it all over the radio and, and you know, you guys in a matter of months did what took us a couple of years, you know, and it's like, you guys are not going to stop. And, um, and we ended up uh, having a great show and we hung out um, till really, really, really late that night and just talked and hung out at the hotel and everything. And then, um, and then from there on, uh, I was just off to the races. That's when we started kind of hanging out, you know, you'd have a party at his house and I'd go hang out there. And I started hearing the beginning of what was dead by sunrise. Mm -hmm. and kind of hearing them play with ideas and, and things that became let down and things that became morning after and stuff like that. So that, that's sort of how it began, you know, over a couple of months. And then, um, and then whenever we were both home, not on tour, you know, we would hang out together a lot and, and play and talk about, you know, in the future, maybe being able to do music together and um, how important it was to kind of be, you know, have an outlet with, your friends that you respect and you've always wanted to play with and all that kind of stuff. And that's sort of how everything kind of started. That's so cool. I mean, you were already a huge band at that point and you saw like this little band from their beginnings, like grow like that. And yeah. you're there from the start. That's so cool. Yeah. Like, I think it's, I think it's cool that those guys have always been from the beginning. They were super cool and they're the biggest band in the world, arguably, and they're still super cool guys they're, they're they're definitely treat us well and they're they could be assholes if they wanted to be because they're big enough but they're not they're they're nice guys actually there's a video of chester singing in fiction with orgy in 2004. yeah uh, we are aware that you played like shows uh a couple shows at that era with uh lincoln park during their hybrid theory tour were there any other performances with um chester 
I think that was it for orgy. I think that was it. And it was at a place called the vault, I believe. And it was right across the street from my house in downtown Long Beach when I lived there and Chester ended up living there too. For It's so funny. We, we, we like lived in the same places. He lived at my house. We did. It's just such a crazy history. Um, but yeah, so, so we were, we were hanging around a lot back then, like a lot. And, um, and they had recently played downtown and then we were playing that show and, and uh, I can't remember. It was just one of those simple things like, dude, you got to come up and play the song with us. And, and he just did it. And it was, it was super cool. It was super fun because, you know, I don't know that you'll ever, anyone will ever see orgy again, you know, at least not the real orgy, you know, because, you know, Jay, does, Jay doesn't want to do it. So with us, so it's a special thing. I mean, I'm sure you have a ton of interesting stories back from that era, like the hybrid theory uh, beginnings and recordings and uh, first shows and stuff. Do you maybe have a favorite uh, story from that period with Chester? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, there's a, a million stories, because, but at, during that period, a lot of, you know, we were hanging out a, a, a lot and playing a lot of shows together. So a lot of it, it doesn't, there's nothing that super stands out other than what I told you. You know what I mean? There's a lot of it was just bread and butter being friends and, and seeing our bands, you know, succeed together. And, um, you know, not, there wasn't any specific, like really like stand at events that I can just think of right now. I mean, there's a hundred parties and get togethers, you know, there's a, a birthday party I had at my new loft downtown that, you know, he came to, and there's pictures that I posted before where he's on my back when I'm hammering, like a hanging a picture up. It's just all this silly stuff and just being, you know, silly and goofy. And, um, you know, he came to a Halloween party. I think he was dressed as, uh, it was a really funny costume. I can't remember if I was Peter Pan or if he was Peter Pan. And it's just stuff like that. It just, it's just all the time, just always hanging out and having fun. And, you know, it wasn't any specific thing it, at, at those times. It was just all fun, silly, cool times and bread and butter, like brotherhood hanging out, you know? Yeah. I mean, I get that. Like, I don't think I can pick one favorite story with like a real cl close friend of mine, like all the little stuff sometimes is what matters, you know, all, all the little totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the little stuff. And back then, you know, especially that, that point, you know, it was a whole lot of, of, you know, uh, you know, it, it, watching him, uh, you know, kill it and just achieve more and more. And, and then when album two was getting ready to happen for Lincoln park, you know, and he sent me the, the initial songs and all that kind of stuff. And he was, you know, nervous and hoping that it would, wouldn't be a sophomore slump. And it was a great album. It was the right move. And there's great songs on it and breaking the habit. And I was, I was just like, okay, well, dude, you guys just, you broke the mold is what you did. It's fucking great. I mean, this is going to do awesome. And it did awesome. And, and so, yeah, there was some, there was some cool stuff. Um, it was all good stuff. I think the only notable stuff was that when, you know, some of the issues with addiction and stuff really started becoming more prevalent. It was around that time when it, started wondering if there could be a deeper problem, you know, that was slowly emerging, you know, that would be, unfortunately, sometimes you remember the heart, the scary parts yeah. more, you know, and the other parts are just good. You know, he put up with me. <laughs> I was a fucking, I was hell on wheels, you know, and we both were, but he was a sweetheart. I could be a little more aggressive and, um, and he, he, he liked me no matter what. No matter how much of a fucker I could be, you know, and I really, I really love that about him. That's great to know. Like that's what good friends are for, right? For the heart. Totally. totally. There's nothing I could do that would make him not be my, my friend. It was kind of amazing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it because I did some stupid shit sometimes. <laughs> so after hybrid theory, uh, Jig Gordon, uh, was created for their mix of points of authority and reanimation. Was Orgs for the word of their mix, for the work of their mix, or specifically Jade? Um, I don't remember exactly, 
but our management teams and uh, and, and Lincoln Park and Orgy were on um, or Lincoln Park was on Warner Brothers and Orgy was on Reprise. So Reprise is a subdivision of Warner Brothers. So we were on the same label essentially. So there's a whole lot of kind of inner commingling and the bands were friends and Jay at the time was, um, you know, really, you know, be trying to kind of do remixes and stuff and kind of utilize the fact that, you know, he's an orgy to get this other stuff. And so he ended up getting that, that remix and did it. And it turned out great. I mean, it was, an, uh, it was a very successful remix um, and it did, it did amazing. Um, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't remember it being offered to orgy. And at the time, um, you know, I certainly wasn't doing remixes or anything like that. I was so the rest of the band didn't make any uncredited contributions, no. maybe to their mix. No. no, it's really a great remix. Probably one of my favorites of the album. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I think it's my favorite. So now I want to ask you like about a bit of debate over the fan base, like it's about the origin of morning after. Because like uh, back in 2001, Chester performed the song a couple times in Linkin Park shows. Mm -hmm. uh, during a chat with fans in 2002, he said it was something he wrote like even before Linkin Park, like when he was still with Grey Days maybe. Um, but when he debuted live, fans reported he said it was a song about sleeping in his car, which indicates it was inspired by the recording of Hybrid Deer, like you told us before. Mm -hmm. So... We also asked Sing Dole in the past uh, about it, and he said he heard the song for the first time during a Bucket of Wings rehearsal. Did uh, Chester Evel tell you the story behind Morning After? Um, I'm sure he did, and I think he did. I'm trying to remember exactly like when I had heard it. I think I'd heard it at his house you know, after, after like a hangout and, and usually people would kind of go in the corners and kind of talk and go outside and me and him would sit there and play guitar and sing and talk. And, um, and he played me morning after at least the, the kind of the version that was there before, because the version that we recorded in dead by sunrise, we sort of did stuff to it. And we, I don't remember if we added a solo or, or if he had that before, I don't think that was there before the dun, 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 dun that I played live. I don't even remember who wrote that part. Um, I know that I play it, but I don't know that I wrote it. Um, and I, I know that it was around, I think before hybrid theory. So it makes me think that it was around when he was sleeping in his car, you know, um, when we first met and it was probably more of a skeleton of a song back then, like the riff, you know, he, he, Chester really comes up with like a riff a lot of times and then vocals. And then that's usually all there is there. And so either, I guess, Mike and the Lincoln Park guys maybe will mess with other aspects of it. What we did was, was we would come in and, you know, make sure that he started with a song that he kind of loved, an idea. And then we would come in and help shape it and add parts and help create a chorus and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but morning after that, that idea, and I heard him play it live, I think in Germany and, and, and maybe some other times I heard the same thing. I, it was very skeletal still. It was just kind of like an, almost an acoustic type of thing. And, um, and we liked it. We just thought it was really, really cool. And so we were like, why don't we just do a, why don't we do this song? Let's, and he goes, he literally goes, just do what you guys do to it. Just make it do what you guys do. And Julian K and orgy, just make it. So he, he left and we did it overnight. And then he came back and he was just like, holy shit. It's like a whole song. And so, um, and that, that's how a lot of dead by sunrise, you know, would work. <laughs> it's a, same thing happened with letdown. You know, he, he came in and he actually sat right here and with the guitar and we recorded him with a microphone over there. We put it right here and just recorded it. You know, that's it. Just the parts that he had, just play the song and sing it. And then he's like, okay, well, I'm going to go home. You guys do whatever you want with it. And we took that thing and we built more, uh, let down the way it is now. And he came back in the next day and we, we played it for him and he, fucking ran out of the room, ran through the house and came back in. He's like a fucking, wow. It's like a whole fucking whole band. And he ran out of the house, ran around and he ran back in the studio and he's like, we're like a band. <laughs> and we were laughing and we're like, yeah. And, that, and that's kind of how dead by sunrise kind of started was he was just like, shit, you know, this is, this is a band. This is like, you guys are bringing this, this music to this level. And he's like, super excited so yeah that's that's how everything kind of started with that and with morning after and all that kind of stuff but morning after existed i mean for a while i think i think before Lincoln park but i can't 
I can't say for sure. I, I don't, I don't know for sure. That's so cool. Like, uh, carrying around this demo for so long and you obviously must have liked it a lot to keep performing it and, uh, working on it all these years. And you finally see it materialized like that, like overnight, just you go to the studio the next day and you have a whole song there. This yeah. Yeah, I think it's when you're a songwriter and, you know, Linkin Park does a specific thing. And I think that not all of it would work for Linkin Park. But as a songwriter, it's still inside of you and you still need it to get out. So I think that we were able to help him do that. And, and we also thought the music was really good. So we thought it was worth, you know, seeing light of day and worth recording and worth working with our friend, you know, on, you know. Actually, do you see that happening a lot as a musician? Like, uh suddenly bringing to life and a very old uh, concept demo idea whatever and yeah it happens yeah it happens with us a lot i have a lot of songs that are just you know maybe it's not the right time or for some reason we don't know the code to it yet we just don't have it figured out and and then sometimes we, we have a new song that we think we're going to release soon that's from our new trauma echoes album and we ended up working with another artist on it because we couldn't figure out how to do the chorus And when you get a fresh set of eyes on it and he just comes in and goes, what about this? And it just does this whole thing. Well, now, now we're like, okay, yeah, we never thought of that. That's a great, that's a great idea. So now we have a solution to the song. And so that song has been sitting there for three years, you know? So, I mean, it could sit for 10 years before someone figures out the, the code, you know, the solution to the song. That's real cool. Um, so during the recordings of Out of Ashes, You had a dashboard like uh, with song titles that aren't mm -hmm. present on the album, like um, somewhere hard life, crowd mm -hmm. tro instrumental, wall of sound, split personality, and evil twin. Were any of the were these like working titles for songs that were released, or these are unreleased songs? Um, they're working titles and probably unreleased ideas. Um, they, a lot of those might have become songs. I think evil twin might've been condemned, um, mm -hmm. hard life. I can't remember. I, I do. I still have that board. Um, I have to go back and look at it and talk to Amir because I don't know that I don't, I, I couldn't tell you if, if what is still, you know, uh, like an unfinished song and what, what was finished on that, you know, on that board, uh, I'll have to go back and look at it sometime when I go back to our storage um, warehouse and break it out and kind of check out what it is and see if there's any other references on it for, for what those were. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of the dead by sunrise stuff that we recorded, um, you know, or that we wrote is out, but there is stuff that we didn't finish. There is some stuff. So we haven't gone through it deeply because we were always waiting, you know, we were going to do it with Chester and we never plan on any of this to happen, of course. Um, so we still haven't sat down and gone through all of it because it's, you know, it's just, it's a big deal. So we just haven't gone, you know, find, found out exactly what pieces are there and all that kind of stuff, but we'll do it at some point and, and maybe we can shine some more light on what those tracks are. Okay. That sounds cool. Mm, so Frank Zuma once said that Bang Sunrise played a surprise reunion show in Arizona at the Marquee Theater where both Julian Kay and Street Drum Corps were set to perform in 2012. Why didn't it materialize? Why didn't it, why didn't it happen? Mm, I don't know. Um, it's tough for me to know like a show that may, that, that, that we were talking about doing and then it didn't happen because there's, you know, probably a thousand shows that have played. It's just, you know, to us, it's not like, you know, this, this huge event that, you know, is an earth shattering thing that it didn't happen. There's a lot of shows that we try to do or we talk about doing or we're in the works of doing and it ends up not happening. You know what I mean? It's, it's sort of just part of the business. I mean, Edema was supposed to play in Vegas this weekend and the, the promoters, you know, didn't have it together and, and it, and it's not happening. So it's like, you know, it, it happens. It's tough to remember exactly what that situation was. I mean, 2012 is, you know, what, eight, nine years ago. I don't remember exactly. So um, Julian Kay has played Let Down and Morning After a few times without Chester, even before he passed. Uh, yeah. Why did you pick those two songs in particular? Is there a reason? Yeah. Um, 
the letdown um we played uh, you know i remember I, I i was talking to chester and i was like hey we're gonna play letdown at this acoustic show that we're doing you know and, and i wanted to see if he was around so he could come play it with us you know and he was like no no but that's awesome he's like send me a video you know i want to see it because he was on tour and he always encouraged us to you know play the music promote the music do do stuff with the brand do you know he he wanted it because it's our band as well so he wanted us to you know utilize it and um and so you know i was like you know if we're not playing together i'll i'll add it into our sets but let down is the one that would work the best acoustically um and and with my voice so it was just kind of an obvious choice for us to you know i can sing it good and play it and it just works good acoustically so we could play it with the julian k acoustic set um and then we played at some memorials for chester we played um uh, morning after and and let down again just trying to find songs that that work with our instrumental setup and that work with my voice so the things that i can sing really well and and still sound like me because i don't want to mimic chester um, um i want to i want to do our songs in my own voice and 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 respect it you know so um and there's some songs where you know you just you have to like almost try to sound like chester to get them done like there's a song that you couldn't you can't really do it's only he can do it um well, i suppose i could probably figure out how to do it but um those ones are the are the the easiest most realistic stuff for me to do and they're also popular songs of, out of our catalog so you know it, it'd be tougher for us to do a more obscure track that's a chester track it just doesn't make as much sense so those are songs that we um we kind of have ready you know we can play them when it's appropriate we can play them when people when we think that people will really like it um and uh and and yeah they've been really really fun i mean even even when he was still here we we definitely played them a few times and it was uh it was really really cool and he and he really liked it you know he thought it was really cool that we could do that it is it is really cool i mean i'm i'm sure fans really liked it too like it's a nice surprise uh in a set like that yeah yeah, we played some show, some uh, shows in Europe, and and one was a memorial for Chester, and, and that we played like five Dead by Sunrise songs, and we asked the Italian singers from the different bands just come up and sing, and we'll be your backing band, and that was really cool. That was like kind of like a fan immersive type of thing, and they got to play with Dead by Sunrise, and it was really really cool. And I just sang backup, and then we played in England after that, and they were really wanted us to like wanted me to play the Dead by Sunrise and sing you know do an encore of the dbs stuff because they're all dbs julian k fans over there especially and you know because we did some real touring over there and um and i just the travel was so hard and i was so exhausted and it just wasn't working for me i have to have everything mentally i have to be really there to be able to do that you know because i have to sing someone else's song or someone else's voice you know i have to I have to do my version of it. So I didn't do it in England and they were, they were bummed, but you know, I'll, I'll do it when I can. I'll do it when I'm feeling strong and I have it inside my heart, you know, in my soul. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you, like mimicking someone else's voice, just, you know, just because uh, that's what fans are used to. I, I agree with you that that's not the, the point. Like you should sing it the way you, you want the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I have to deal with also with edema, you know, coming in and, you know, the first thing we had to do is we had to go out and reestablish the brand because the brand has been going all over the place, mm -hmm. right? They've been different singers, mm -hmm. the music's changing. So when I got in the band, and I know this is one of your questions as well, I sat down and I said, guys, if you guys want me to do this, I love your music. I love this band and I love you guys. And this sounds fun to me. It sounds interesting to me. Um, I've never done anything like this. I've never joined someone else's band. You know, I've always started my own bands. I've always been the boss and I've always been the singer or the, or the lead guy in, in almost every situation. And, uh, you know, to come in and fill someone else's shoes who arguably is a really well-known and popular singer. Marky Chavez is, he sounds like Jonathan Davis. You know, those are, that's really hard to figure out how you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, we're all from Bakersfield. We all have this mentality. So we're going to zero in on that hard. And we're going to do the first two albums that I know that all of your fans love. The other albums are kind of, they're kind of split. 
not everyone's liking it, not, you know, the different singers, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not really interested in singing their stuff, to be honest with you. I'm not, I didn't resonate as much with that. I resonated more with album one and two. And I said, the music that we're going to write, if, if fans like me singing it, and if this works, the music that we're going to write is going to be, we're going to go back and look at those first two albums and remember where we came from. And we're going to re-embrace a modern interpretation of new metal because I feel like that's missing right now. I feel like that needs to happen. So all this other stuff you guys did, it's cool, but I don't want to do the musical journey with you. I want to do what I think the band should be doing, you know, and that's where I'm going. And that's sort of why we play um, music from the first two albums. Cause I needed to make sure that I could sing it my way and that the majority of fans would like it. And the majority have liked it. There's, there's about 3% of people that, I mean, I thought it would be more, to be honest with you. I thought people would be kind of, I thought it would be 50-50. But it's honestly about 95, 98%. We get about, like, say if we get 500 comments, there's about three that are shitty about me. You know, and that's fine. You know, but, um, like, um, you know, and about half of those. Singer was, uh, there would be shitty comments. Like, people hate always. Like, you can't please yeah. everyone. Yeah. And well, it, people say, you know, you guys shouldn't be playing the old songs and everything. And, and, and they say really mean kind of bully like stuff. And I, and I just think to myself, well, go tell ACDC, Alice in Chains, Journey, um, Stone Temple Pilots. I'm, I'm like, I'm out on tour with these guys and they're playing huge venues. You know, I was out with Stone Temple Pilots with a new singer playing their awesome old songs and new songs. And I'm like, it's fucking bullshit. You know, it's complete bullshit. Those guys wrote those songs all of them, you know, and Tim sang on a lot of those songs and he's still singing. So yeah, you know, they have the right to play their songs that they wrote, you know, and I have the right to go in there and sing them in my own way and write new songs, you know, and we have the right to sell thousands of tickets <laughs> to people to come see us that support the band, you know? So, you know, it's, 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 I find that a lot, very few of the comments are based in anything other than sort of being like a like a kind of like an internet bully oh yeah like like anyone that anyone that says you guys should should you guys should just stop playing this singer is not the you know this isn't the right singer you know and I, well you should stop doing your your job just don't eat don't eat don't make any money just you should just you know because you because you're probably not that good at it so i mean isn't that a bully thing to say it's a bully and you know i made a living proving the bullies in my life wrong. I mean, I really, I really stand by that, that musicians should do whatever they want, because like, it's, it's a fact that you can't please everyone. Like, even if you just totally. put a new album, like some fans are going to hate it. They're going to say like, it's not like the past album and it's not like yeah. the one before. And been obviously a huge Linkin Park fan. I see that like in every album, every album. Yeah. Because the band has to keep making new music, you know, and the thing is the old music doesn't go away. You still, they're still going to play it all, but they can't make the same album after album after album. And, you know, so it's, I totally hear you, but the good news is that most people, I mean, vastly the most, like, I mean, I had people coming up to me at the shows that had tears in their eyes and they were like, this is the first time we've seen the band sound like the band and act like the band and you guys played all the most popular songs and i was like hello that's what you got to do in a band you can't just go up there to please yourself you have to you're in a partnership with your fans you're in a relationship with your fans you're not going up there to masturbate you're going up there to have a reciprocal relationship with them so you have to consider them and i think that that now that edema is really doing that and now we're doing that i think that things have been Things have been great. And the first single is going to hit the hit the nail on the head. We're going to hit it right on the head. And everyone that thinks that, you know, maybe my voice isn't right for new metal or this kind of stuff, but they're all going to have to like go cry in a closet because it's really good. And um, I had a great teacher. His name was Chester. And um, turns out I can do a lot of stuff that I don't do in Julian K. And uh, I can do it on this music. So um, I think people are going to be, I think Chester fans, Lincoln Park fans, Edema fans, 
all that kind of music, Edema, uh, uh, Linkin Park album one and two and three, and Edema album one and two fans, I think they're going to go crazy. <laughs> I really can't wait myself. And you've actually talked about uh, how Chester helped you with vocals earlier on in the past too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I think it was during the promotion for Time Capsule that, mm -hmm. like you said, he on early Julian K material, like some of the demos still had Chester's guide vocals in the background. Like, um, how was the whole process like uh, working with Chester back then as like in that way, like helping you with the vocals and everything? Well, he's the one that, that basically talked me into finally being the lead singer, you know, um, in Orgy, you know, I sang a lot and wrote vocals and wrote lead vocals and, and sang, I mean, a lot. I mean, if you watch live Orgy vocal uh, uh, songs, there's songs where I'm singing half the song, literally half the song. So I've always been a singer, uh, you know, on our albums and live, but I never wanted to be the lead singer. Um, And uh, I never thought that I was good enough. And Chester was the first one to come in when I was writing the Julian K stuff initially um, and just told me like, look, you shouldn't be looking for a singer. You are the singer. And, um, you know, we were kind of looking for a singer. So he's all, I don't know why you're doing this. He's like, you, you can do it. And so he gave me the courage and he started coming in when I would be recording and I would play him the songs that we've done. And he would come up with an idea and, and I was like, I can never sing that high. I can never do it. And he's like, you just got to do it. Here's how you do it. You know? And he would kind of show me the way he uses his body and, and then he would sing it and put like a harmony in there or something. And sometimes he would leave it as a guide for me to kind of learn it, you know, and then I would learn it and sing it again. So that it would be me. And he really, really helped me break through the psychological barriers and the, and the physical training and learning portion of being a singer being a singer is very physical you know and you have to um i mean he really really taught me about all the stuff that you have to do physically the way you're standing the way you have to be breathing um where where are your voices happening in your head um he, he was he was instrumental in that and he taught me for years and years and years but i wouldn't be able to do like the screams that I do on the new edema stuff and the old stuff, but the, the new stuff, people are going to be like, what the fuck? You know, um, I wouldn't have been able to do that without him showing me and me and me being in the room in this room with him every day, listening to him do it. You know, I, that's how I kind of started figuring out how you make that voice happen. So he was instrumental in helping me become a lead singer. And I, I give him the most credit out of anyone, but of course, you know, being in a band with Jay, you know, Jay didn't want to, be a lead singer either by the way we argued over who was going to be the singer he lost because he's taller than me um but, but we both probably um but you know being around jay and all, and all the great singers that we've been able to be around that all that was i mean jonathan davis was my first fucking bandmate jonathan davis and dave deru from edema so can you imagine being 17 years old and you're a band with john davis i mean hearing his voice back then i uh, it was the first time i heard a voice that when he sang it sounded like the radio playing mm -hmm. and that's how i felt with chester for some reason when chester sang anything it just sounded like okay well that's a hit you know and, and <laughs> you know and so i i learned that they just ha they have this quality to their voice that's just incredible you know but I, i i learned a lot listening to them you know and i told john the last tour that we did You know, Jonathan and I, uh, Jonathan was so cool and he brought us on tour. He didn't need to. He brought us because he likes us and he likes our music and we're old friends. And I would just talk to him and go like, dude, you, you know, he was like, oh, I really like the songs. You're doing good as being a singer. And I'm like, well, I learned from you and Chester. Like you guys, you don't think you're doing anything, but I watch, I listen, <laughs> I see how you're standing. I see how you talk. I see how you sing. I see where you hold the microphone. I see everything. So I'm like a little sponge, <laughs> you talented guys. Yeah. You had some of the best to learn from, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Linkin Park fans, uh, some think that Chester actually has some backing vocals from those like sessions. Like uh, specifically on the Brandon Belsky remix of Maestro, and mm -hmm. um, 
in technical difficulties. Is Chesser actually, does he actually have some backing vocals on those songs? He does. Um, I cannot confirm or deny that they are on those particular recordings for certain reasons. Okay. <laughs> But yes, yes, Chester uh, uh, has been on that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't know specifically exactly what stuff you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, uh, Chester was uh, all up in our shit. Mm -hmm. Chester, Chester wanted to join Julian K, and we started laughing. And that's when we, we were like, why don't we make a band with you? <laughs> and he's like, okay. But he, he really, he really liked Julian K. And he was, he was like, I'll, I'll play with you guys. And we're like, well, okay. Like, I, I, what are you going to do? Like, if, because if you're going to sing, then I might as well stop singing, you know, because <laughs> you're so good. So yeah, he did sing on a lot of stuff. You know, we didn't put a lot of the, you know, we would take him off because we don't want to have issues with the label, you know, having a problem with him being on a recording of ours. So that's one of the reasons I say I can't confirm or deny, you know, but um, yeah, he, there are, there is stuff um, um, that he's been on um, and technical difficulties, um, the screaming, we, we are just like he did live. Yeah. I believe on our album, I believe we, I believe he's credited. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he is on there. Uh, I can't confirm or deny, I think, I don't know. Uh, Other than in, as an executive, I'm not sure if he's crazy. Mm. Okay, maybe he's not. I'll have to go back and look. So sure. I can't confirm or deny then. I don't know. <laughs> um, also around the release of uh, Time Capsule, you expressed the desire to make something similar for Dead by Sunrise. Have you thought more about that? Any updates? You can yeah, here's what I th here's what I think we want to do with Dead by Sunrise right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Patreon. Julian K has a Patreon, mm -hmm. but what it really is is it's becoming Adima, Julian K, like anything you know, Dead by Sunrise, anything Amir and Ryan work on is stuff that we do live events. So we do like a live acoustic cover once a month. Um, we do live Zoom sessions where we have like a lot of fans on a zoom session live with me or Amir and we have our, uh, one of our songs up with all the tracks and we break down track by track, how we did things and what the lyrics mean. We isolate the vocals so you can hear the vocal mm -hmm. and it's very cool. If you're a fan of anything we do, you really will like our Patreon. It's amazing. And we do all sorts of like private stuff for our fans and it's really cool. We've been floating an idea we were thinking about doing it on the 10 year anniversary um, or, or some anniversary or maybe on his birthday or something of instead of doing Julian K songs, maybe we could take the dead by sunrise, you know, album out of ashes and start doing once a month. Um, we could do a special like year long deep dive into, into dead by sunrise and we could get the, you know, the Lincoln park dead by sunrise fans that, that like this kind of stuff they could come support us on Patreon, which helps us create this, you know, to create the material and create these sessions and everything. We have to, it costs money. We have to figure out how to do it and work on it and everything. So if they would come support us, we could do like a, like a, like a monthly deep dive or a maybe, maybe every other week deep dive and break out all the tracks and go through every single track with the fans live. And what's cool is when you do it on Zoom is they can ask questions and we can talk about it. We can tell stories and everything. And it's a fucking cool experience. And we do it with Julian K and the other stuff that we're working on. But we really thought that that might be the coolest way to kind of honor um, Out of Ashes and just get the Dead by Sunrise fans um, kind, of, kind of in our world, kind of following what we do, because that's an important thing for us. Um, and I think that some people don't realize that we have this Patreon that is really, really a deep dive, a cool, it's a learning experience. It's a master class. It's, I mean, you can see like by my zoom setup here, you know, I have a pretty serious setup. We have multiple cameras in the studio and we can do this. You know, I can switch between cameras with a controller over here. It's very, very cool. And I can, I can hit a button and, and show you my, my computer screen and all this fantastic shit, but we would like to do it with dead by sunrise. And, and tell the stories that go along with it and isolate his voice to where you can kind of hear his, 
his incredible tones that he makes and everything. I think that might be a really special thing for Dead by Sunrise fans, but it's the trick for us will just be to, you know, we want to get them all to get involved and listen because we don't want to just do it for like 10 people. We want to, we want to serve and celebrate Chester and the fans that love that music, you know? So that's been what we kind of, we've been rolling it around in our heads with how we might kind of reintroduce the music to, to fans that way. I mean, I know for a fact that'd be so cool. Like, uh, I know fans would get in there like crazy for sure. Like, that's definitely something everyone would like to see. Yeah, maybe some people can join. And I mean, it, you know, it's not a ton of money. It's not like a huge cash thing for us, but it's just, it helps us continue to, you know, have the money to do the stuff that we want to do. Um, so maybe we can, maybe you guys can put it out a little bit that we want to do that maybe some people can join. And once we kind of see if there's interest, then we can start putting together the series and we can set dates. Like we're going to do crawl back in, we're going to do letdown, we're going to do, and we'll put the dates and then everyone can, we can make a, you know, a big group out of it and really have like a fun session. And, you know, they're, they're good, like hour and a half, you know, two hour long sessions where we do these deep dives into the music and, I think people will hear a lot of stuff they've never heard. Oh yeah, pretty cool. Do you think something like that might uh, might end up like uh, getting you to do a project similar to Time Capsule for Dead by Sunrise, like some official release? Well, the, the the trick with that is that you know it's a you know it's a Warner Brothers project. You know we can't just do whatever we want with it. Like with Julian K. We can do really cool products because we can do whatever we want. You know, we, we own our own label. We can do anything with, with Warner Brothers and with, with Chester and the estate and all of it. There's a lot of people that we have to check with before we do anything. So it's like even doing like this DBS thing that I'm talking about doing it, doing it privately, you know, that's why it's like they would need to join our Patreon and do, because it's not, we can do it then. And we're doing it with recordings that we have and all that kind of stuff. So it's not as big of a deal, but for us to put out a commercial product, um, you know, I, we have to, we have to sit down and deal with Warner brothers and deal with, you know, all this kind of shit and the managers. And, and I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. It's just, it's a lot more serious, you know, it's difficult for us to do. And there's a lot of people with a lot of competing interests. So, um, that's been very, very hard for us to deal with because Chester wanted us to do, wanted us to do stuff. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to keep doing, you know, as much as we could with the band and utilize the band and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and we have to be a little bit careful with what we do because in some ways we have another party that now represents Chester. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this label and managing, you know, we just have to be kind of careful that we don't, you know, pull the thread out of a sweater so to speak, or, or accidentally get ourselves in some sort of reprimand, you know, like, so, you know, even though it's our music and we can do stuff with it, we, we, we still have to answer to, you know, a major label and all that kind of stuff, which is not something we're really used to, you know, anymore. We used to be used to it, but in the modern age, you know, the new edema singles coming out on my label, you know, so we can do whatever we want with it. You know, we shot a video, we did all this cool stuff. We can do whatever we want with the content. You know, which means that we're going to continue to take that song and do unique things with it, you know, so that's good for fans. I mean, uh, during, uh, like, but Chester was kind of featured in some parts of Time Capsule. What, was there was there an issue with that? Was that easy to deal with the label and everything? Um, I don't remember specifically. Um, I don't remember specifically what we did, but I think we had gotten permission for that stuff. That's cool. I think from Chester. See, when, when Chester was around, the permission was yes. Oh. That's yeah. He, he, it was just like, he would just be like, anything you guys want to do, I'm behind. You know, he encouraged us to do stuff. He encouraged us to utilize the stuff that we've created together. He wanted to be part of our stuff. So, you know, it's just now he's not here to speak for himself. So, you know, it's a, just a little bit more of a, a group now of people that kind of represent yeah. his interests. It's harder for us to, you know, we just have to be more careful with how we do things. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I also just uh, just thought of something random. Like, uh, I wanted to ask like about this. This room makes you guys dead. Like, uh, it was the song. What do they know with mindless self indulgence? 
Yeah. Do you remember that? Like it just yeah. really popped up, popped up in my head. And uh, I always felt like that was really interesting for a uh, Jillian K and Chester project. And I just wanted to ask like, what's the story behind that? Well, we were touring with mindless self-indulgence and they're our friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we, and we loved that album. And I think they were just like Lincoln Park was looking for remixes. They were looking for remixes and, um, and it happened to get kind of offered to us. And we, we wanted to do it like as a collaboration, because keep in mind the beginning of dead by sunrise and Julian K and uh, in that era of Lincoln Park was all kind of happening in this studio, you know, all together. So everything that we were always working on, you would have a day that would be half dead by sunrise morphing into Julian K. And then, you know, you can imagine there would be next to me, there's different, you know, people that are working on the stuff and all around me, there's all these guitars and behind us, there's keyboards everywhere and we're just being creative and working. So when, when a remix comes through, it kind of comes into the factory and we all were like, Hey, let's work on it together. Let's, let's, let's have Chester be part of it. Let's have me be part of it. Let's have, you know, let's do it, do it as a, as a, as a group. And that's kind of how that kind of stuff happened. Okay. That's cool. Um, so we talked before about how you're currently the frontman for Edema. Mm -hmm. How did you join the band? I joined the band after an unsuccessful attempt to get their their original singer to be the singer. <laughs> so I was trying to talk to Marky mm -hmm. on the side to, to, to join, to stay in Edema, do the right thing, and then go on tour with Julian K. Cause we were going to do a big tour together. And I thought it was going to be a perfect tour. Cause we have a lot of, we share fans. Mm -hmm. So our fan, our fans would, would like it. A lot of Julian K fans love Edema. A lot of Edema fans are the biggest Julian K fans. I don't know why it's really weird. And, um, um, I talked to Marky for a, for a, a couple of weeks with the band and Marky and I was kind of negotiating for them. And finally, my last conversation with Marky, he goes, you know, I just don't like that music. I, I just don't want to sing it. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, why didn't you just tell me that? Why did I just waste my time? Cause I, I go, I'm not going to talk you into doing something that you don't love. No, of I love your music. I love edema and I love these guys. You're telling me you don't love it. He's like, yes, I, I don't, I don't, don't like it. I go, well then conversation's over. <laughs> and then I called the band and I go, guys, Marky doesn't like the band. He doesn't like the fans. He doesn't want to do this music. He doesn't like any of this. He has another idea that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I go, I'm sorry guys, but it's not going to happen. And so, um, we're not going to tour and we're just going to, I'm going to keep having my career and I'm sorry. I love you guys. And they go, okay, darn it. That sucks. I guess we're done. And Adema is a, you know, they sold over a million albums. Um, they still get offers and they got another tour offer like six, seven months later. Mm -hmm. And it was a big tour. And, um, it was this, uh, power man, 5,000 edema head PE. And it was a, that's a good tour and you'll make money doing that. And they were all bummed, you know, they were like, fuck man, you know, fuck, you know, this is our job and we can't go do our job. And I know what that's like because I'm an orgy. So I know what it's like to have it taken away from you because the singer doesn't want to do it and have all of your, your, your job and your, your livelihood taken from you. You imagine that you work your whole life to become a band that people want to pay and see, and then you can't go do it anymore. What do you do? What do you do? Go to McDonald's, you know, and it's like, it's really hard. And, um, I wasn't very cool with that, that idea. I think it sucks. And, yeah, um, cause it's like someone else taking a decision for your life. Yep. Like a big yep. Life. It's Yep. Just like, just like the band is in a relationship with their fans, the band is in a relationship as well. And in a relationship, Sometimes you don't necessarily want to do it all the time, but if you make a commitment, you're in a relationship. You got to understand that everyone relies on you to make money and you rely on everyone else to make money. And then you have it with the fans too. So this is all grown up level shit, but some people aren't like that. And, um, and, and I take the livelihood of artists very seriously. And I don't like to hear about artists getting railroaded by like one guy. It's not fair. It's not cool. I don't like that. I don't respect it. 
And um, Chris Coles called me out of the blue. And I answered the phone and I go, hey, man, how you doing? He's like, oh, man, good. You know, dude, we got offered another big tour and fuck, you know, really bummed. And I, and, and I go, man, I'm so sorry. I was like, I tried. I tried to fix it. He goes, well, why don't you come sing for us? And I was like, what? I'm like, I'm, I'm like the lead singer of a well-known band. Like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. He's like, well, yeah, but you know, maybe you could do, maybe just do this too, or maybe you could do both. And, you know, we're, we're getting offered this much money. It could be really good. You know, you can make money, we can make money. And we really want to play these songs where we miss playing. We like going out on tour. We like the fans. You know, Marky doesn't really like it. We like it. And I was like, well, fuck, so do I. And you guys are all like really good friends of mine. And I'm like, well, let, let me, you know, I called Amir and I go, what do you think about this? And Amir just goes, well, you know, Julian K doesn't tour. We don't tour 200 days out of the year. And we tour like twice a year, maybe. He's like, there's plenty of time to do it if you like it, you know, and if you sound good playing the music, if you sound good singing it, then he's all, I support it. So I drove to Bakersfield secretly and did a rehearsal with them. It sounded fucking great. They were all excited. And then I told Amir, I was like, hey, man, I'm going to, maybe I'll try and we'll see how this tour goes. But if it goes well, you know, we'll figure out a way to split, to split the responsibilities and, I'll come up with a business way to make it all work, you know, financially and everything. And so we decided to do it, announced it, and then um, did the tour. The tour turned out amazingly. Um, fans were coming up to me with tears in their eyes. and It was great. And then from there, we decided to keep going. And then that's here we are now. And then we've, we've written the new songs. And I think fans have heard some glimpses of the new songs. And I think they understand that it's serious. It's not a joke. It's very, very, it's the best music they've done since their first album. Okay. So, yeah. That's I, I'm, I'm saying that very confidently. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I already know what the comments are going to be. I already know. I already know the people that the haters, I already know what they're going to go. Oh, fuck. Well, this guy's not too bad. You know, he's not, he's no Marky, but oh, this is a pretty good song. I already know dummies. I'm already there. And then the fans that support the band, they're going to love it. They're going to love it. Actually, each time Adema changes vocalists, they also drastically change their sound. Yeah. What can we expect from the new album? You said you're kind of going back to the roots, like the first two, but yeah. like maybe a more modern new metal sound? Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's it's going to be, if you like the two first two albums, you're going to love what we're doing, but it just, it sounds better. And it's a more it's a more modern approach to the recording and to the mentality and all that kind of stuff. But you're going to have those, you know, those those synthesizer sounding, you know, melodies on the on the choruses that they had on album one and two because you got Mike Ransom back in the band. So Tim and Mike together, it's like you know Head and Monkey from Corn. You got this this playoff that makes this edema sound. So you're going to have all that. And on those other albums with the other singers and without Mike, you don't have that. So now you're going to have the whole band sounding like the band, you know? So if you like the original Edema stuff, you're going to really like this. And, you know, theme wise, lyrically wise, I'm really hitting on the themes of, you know, where we come from it. Cause we all come from Bakersfield and Taft, California, you know, this small town, hot, you know, miserable way of growing up. And um, so I think that this, the albums, even though I'm not copying Marky, I'm doing my thing. I'm from there. Mm -hmm. So we grew up together. So you're going to get the themes and the feeling that you get from the original shit. The people won't understand why it reminds them of the first albums because it's going to be different. But for some reason, they're going to feel like it feels like the first two albums because the story matters. The story matters. The authenticity matters. The roots matter. And that's going to come through. I mean, that's really cool because like fans tend to ask for uh, bands to like do stuff like their earlier sounds again. Yeah. So yeah, bands always evolve. And mm -hmm. it's cool to see that you're going back to the original sound with today's standards you know today's uh technology today's uh everything and i think yeah. fans are gonna be pleased like it's cool when artist needs meets 
what fans want, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's important, and I think you really need to do that. I think that bands really need to think of their 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 fans, because mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I say it over and over, but it's a relationship, you know. And it doesn't mean that the artist can't push the artistic boundaries, and it doesn't mean that we can't lead and bring people along with us. We can, but you got to do it with with finesse. Mm -hmm. You got to do it. You got to build a bridge for people to go over on. You can't just go, Hey, here's a new thing over here. And there's a huge chasm in between, you know, um, and you guys are over here. Now we're here. Fuck you. That's not what you do. You go, Hey, here's a bridge. We know who we are and we know who you are. We remember, we respect you and we're still who we are and we're going here. Come along with us. I really can't wait to see what you have come up with. Like, a reimagined new metal sound in today's era. Like I can't wait. Cool. I can't wait to play it for you. <laughs> August 20th. August 20th is the is the date. Uh, it'll be for sure in about a week when we know that we have it in the system. We know the video is finished. Mm -hmm. um, but August 20th is the date and it'll be just before we leave for uh, our September tour. Yeah, actually, you recently filmed uh, the music video for the third single. Yeah. What Tell us about it and uh, when can we expect it? The video will likely come a few days after the single release because that's just the way it works now. You In, in, the, in the new modern era of digital singles, um, it's a Friday drop. There's promotion before that leading up to it, maybe an event, Friday drop, and then the, oh, an event or something on the weekend, and then you want to drop the video the next week. Mm -hmm. So that's probably when it'll come out someday, maybe a Tuesday or something after the 20th. Um, and I can't tell you what it's, what the theme of the video is. Um, I've got to let the video be a surprise. Um, but all I can tell you is that it, I think that, I think that the fans of that genre of music are going to really, really, really resonate with it because it's very authentic. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is a cool concept to it. Okay. So it's very authentic. It's very real. And it and it hits you know down into the vein of what that music is, um, but at the same time there is a there is a clever theme. I think I think they're gonna and it's simple and it's not, but it's gonna it's gonna get a visceral reaction. People are gonna get the that feeling of they're gonna want to fucking you know get moving and, and fucking fighting and they're gonna have that feeling and that's what we wanted to create was that feeling when you first saw a corn video. I mean, you're like, what the fuck? Yes, you know, you feel, you felt like you saw your heroes. Well, we kept that in mind, you know. I was one of those kids too, you know, that sees this shit. So I remember how to be excited, and I think we created something that'll excite people. That's real cool. I mean, personally, I still like check out uh, new, uh, like modern new new metal bands, like people like bands that are recent and they still do new metal and stuff. And even though there are a lot that I love the music, I haven't found what you're talking about. I haven't found the visuals to go along with it. That yeah. old, uh, like early 2000s or late 90s brought us. Like the yeah. feeling that you're, that you're describing. Yeah, you are going to love it. And, you know, the cool thing is that, you know, we are, we are the pioneers of that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, we did it. You know, we created that feeling, us and our friends. So that's something I want Edema to really, really own. Is I want fans to see what I see when I'm on stage with these guys and we're rocking everyone together. And I look behind me a little bit and I see this monster of a band and it, I get excited. Like I get chills on my arm and I feel like, yeah, you know, like I'm in this band. This is so cool. Um, I want people to, to see this. I want them to feel that feeling that I feel. And so, you know, I remember, I remember what it was like, you know, 20 years ago when we, 25 years ago when we started this shit, you know, and I, and I think that we, out of anyone, we're allowed to do it. We're allowed to be the, the, the standard bearers right now. I think it's cool. It is. It is. It really is. Mm, so we're down to the last question. I, I've got like 
five minutes left too, so I have another Zoom. So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> good with <This> perfect. <laughs> so I matured with Lincoln Park for three years in a row, starting during the hybrid theory tour, and once again, yeah. Here. Like, have you heard any cool stories from your bandmates, maybe that you didn't know of? Uh, like a thousand. Edema is the best storytelling band ever. They really know as a group of people, they're interesting and they have good stories. But the one that I like the best that, that means the most to me spiritually, it's kind of not going to be as funny, but it is kind of funny. Chester essentially got edema on those tours and essentially helped discover edema. And when they told me that, especially, you know, when Chester passed and all this kind of stuff and they, you know, so many, probably a thousand of my, yeah, I, it sounds crazy. I have like a thousand friends. I don't know. Maybe a couple hundred of my friends reached out and told me these private things about Chester. And, um, they told me that, um, you know, Tim said that Chester came out, you know, after seeing them play, went out to the parking lot of like a big venue, you know, you can have all the hundreds of cars out there and he came out there in the parking lot and hung out with them and said, like, you guys need to play with love with Lincoln Park. Like you guys are amazing. And like you guys, this is, you know, same thing I told Chester, I guess, you know, I was like, you guys are going to be something. This is going to, going to happen for you. And that's how they got on those shows. Chester picked them. He went out there after seeing them, went out into the parking lot when they're sitting there all fucking, you know, poor and in a shitty fucking vehicle and, you know, probably packing up their stuff and probably drinking beers in the parking lot. And he, and that's the kind of guy Chester was, you know, and he went out there and he fucking, he, he was their champion just like he did for us. And just like I did for him, you know, he, he had their back. And, and so they have a very special place in their hearts for him. And it makes me feel good about doing this with them. because I feel like Chester would go, you should, you should go in and save that band. They don't deserve to sit at home, not making money off their music and not playing for their fans. Just like he did for Stone Temple Pilots. Stone Temple Pilots doesn't deserve because one guy, you know, made his decisions and fucked up. They don't deserve to lose their livelihood. And just like a demon does not deserve to lose their livelihood because Marky doesn't want to do it. They don't deserve it. And any fans that say otherwise aren't really fans, they're bullies. I love that story. Beautiful. It's so cute. It is. So just. <laughs> he's, a, he's a fucking cutie, that guy. I love him. Oh, my gosh. Oh, so, yeah, that's all my questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for, it was perfect timing. So I have a I have a 130. So I have a couple minutes to get my get my head on and get ready for that. So, yeah. Thank you so much for doing it. And it was crazy to meet you. Like, it was real good. You're really cool. And where, where are you located, by the way? Greece, Europe. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's good. I haven't, but I, I just think it's so cool that that's where you are. And we're just talking via Zoom. And it's just such a such a new world. I mean, it's just such a special thing. But I want to thank you and I want to thank everyone from your whole side and LP Live. And the, I know that you guys are a vast group of really, really unified and cool people. And I just, you know, please get the word out that we want to do this special Dead by Sunrise, kind of like a year long sort of celebration and, you know, help us help us get people involved because we want to celebrate it. We want to be part of, of your guys' world and we want you to be part of ours. And we're super grateful and uh, we, we love you from from Julian K and the Edema guys. We all have the greatest respect for you. So thank you. For sure. Like when uh, when you're ready, just DM us and we'll for sure promote the shit out of it. We'll, mm. <laughs> we'll be glad to. <laughs> thank you so much. So I have your email. So we'll be talking, my friend. OK, thank you. you so take much care. For your time. Take care, too. All right. See you soon. OK. <laughs> Bye.